from John chapter 5 uh, this morning. If you have kids in first through eighth grade and they want to be a part of our Christmas program this year, it's a good time to go get scolded by Brenda Rust. So, <laughs> see you, Brenda. <laughs> yeah, I will be scolded now. Yes. <laughs> As the uh, kids are walking out here and as you're turning to John chapter 5, let's uh, have a word of prayer this morning. Father in heaven, we just uh, gather together this morning in a very special way to um, proclaim our love for you, our worship to you. God, and our heart's desire is that um, you would be front and center, that your word would do what only your word can do in our heart, that is to change us, to transform us. Father, direct us to your will. As we look to your word this morning, whatever is uh, going on in the hearts and lives of our families that, that have come here this morning, I just pray that your word would give insight and wisdom and guidance to those things that uh, we would willingly and um, expectantly bow to your sovereign will and, and to your guidance. Um, Lord, just uh, um, as we look to Thanksgiving and, and the holiday time, you got to pray for all of our families that it would be a, it a great time of thankfulness to you for what you have done in all of our hearts. And uh, Lord, we just ask all these things to you, Father, through the Son and by the Spirit. Amen. Well, Flannery O'Connor wrote a a short story called Revelation. And um, the whole story takes place in a hospital, a doctor's office waiting room. Some of you guys might have read it. The main character in the short story is Miss Turpin. And Miss Turpin is the wife of a hog farmer. There's gospel music that's playing in the background of the waiting room, and Miss Turpin finishes all the ends of the verses. She knows all the, all the songs by heart. She knows all the hymns, and she fills them in. And all Miss Turpin could do is talk about how lucky she was that she was her. She had come, and she had become the person that she was. She wasn't an African-American. She had beautiful skin. There was not a wrinkle on her face. Uh, Flannery O'Connor writes, To help anybody out that needed it was her philosophy in life. She never spared herself when she found somebody in need, whether they were white or black or trash or decent. Of all that she had to be thankful for, she often said, make me a good woman. It don't matter what else, how fat, how ugly, or how poor, make me a good woman. And right across the waiting room for Mrs. Turpin was an 18-year-old girl that Flannery O'Connor describes a, a face blue with acne. Uh, just a horrible disposition on her and a a scowl on her face that was unforgettable. And Miss Turpin says in the story, she thought how pitiful it was to have a face like that at her age. And she comments that one of the worst things that you can have in life is a bad disposition. She says, I think people with bad dispositions are, are to be more pitied than anybody else on earth. And all this girl did was she sat opposite of Miss Turpin and she stared into the eyes of Miss Turpin. She had this book in her hands, and she held on to it tightly. And Miss Turpin just, she couldn't think, what are you looking at? You know, what is the deal? Why are you giving me this glare, this eye? And, and it was almost as if, Flannery O'Connor says, it's almost as if this 18-year-old girl, face blue with acne, was looking right into her heart. And then before she knows it, the book that the 18-year-old girl was holding on to is flying across the room and hits Miss Turpin right in the face, right in the corner of her face, knocks her out flat on her back, and this 18-year-old girl comes on top of her and begins choking her with two hands. And in all the madness and all the chaos, the people in the waiting room kick the girl off of Miss Turpin. The doctors come out, and they check on her to see if everything is okay. And Miss Turpin is able to get out this one little phrase to this, to this girl that everybody thinks is a lunatic. Every, everybody thinks she's crazy. And she says, what in the world do you have to tell me? What in the world do you have to say to me? And she says this. She says, go back to hell where you came from, you old warthog. And this is why the story is called Revelation. Miss Turpin realized that this 18-year-old girl had just given her a revelation about herself that she didn't even know existed. And... uh Here's Miss Turpin, you know, she thinks she's better than everybody else. She takes care of people, she gives to the poor, she goes to church, she reads her Bible, 
on a, on a daily basis, on a regular basis. And here she is sitting in a hospital waiting room of all places. And she gets hit by a book from Mary Grace. The source of it was from Grace. And the implication, you don't have to be a literary scholar, Miss Turpin is the nice lady. She goes to church, she reads her Bible, and through all of her years, she knows absolutely nothing about the grace of God that's found in the text. Here's my first problem with God's word as we approach this. Um, We know that God's word is lawful. We know that it's full of morality. And yet Jesus comes on the scene and the people that he is the harshest against in his ministry are the most lawful and the most moral people at his time. We know that the um, word of God has, has given us an example to live by, and, and the people that are living by that example, that's the people who Jesus comes the hardest against. Here's my second problem with God's word. Jesus insisted on the priority of Scripture over human tradition right before he initiates his own human traditions. All food is clean. You can eat anything now. Jesus says of the commandments, obey your father and mother, and just text later, sentences later, he says, if anybody wants to be my follower, you must hate your father and mother. Jesus said there's going to be a great hope when everybody will come and dine at the kingdom feast of God from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And then he says the heirs of the kingdom are going to be cast out. What is the deal? The verses of scripture seem that we can be interpreted in black and white, but we cannot obey them in black and white. These verses of scripture seem to say, take it or leave it, but we don't even know how to take it or leave it. Jesus doesn't even seem to know how to take it or leave it. N.T. Wright says, the old picture of Jesus as the teacher of timeless truths or even the announcer of the essential timeless call for a decision will simply have to go. Jesus came in authority with the message of the kingdom, imminent catastrophe, repentance, change your heart. I'm making all things new. And this is the authority of scripture. It's the message of Jesus. N.T. Wright says, Authority is the sovereign rule of God sweeping through creation to judge and to heal. It is the powerful love of God in Jesus Christ putting to sin and putting sin to death and launching a new creation. The authority in God's word is not simply do this, don't do that, don't do that. Authority is the message of Jesus, which is the message of the kingdom, which is a healing message for the brokenhearted, for the humble. For the kingdom to be fulfilled in him, for Israel, and for the rest of the world. In John 5, 31 through 47 this morning, Jesus is going to talk about the authority of God's word. And he's going to tell us three things. What authority of God's word sounds like, what it looks like, and finally what it tastes like, what it lives like is what I want to do with the final one there. What the authority of God sounds like, what it looks like, and then ultimately what it tastes like. We cannot approach the authority of God's word like an encyclopedia. We cannot go to scripture like some spiritual cut and paste system. Everything is not black and white in the pages of scripture. And I know we want to do that. But if Jesus wanted to give us black and white text on marriage, he would have said, go to the book of marriage. I've got it all outlined for you in bullet point format. And we would have an article on marriage. But he doesn't do that. If he wanted to say, here's everything you need to know about parenting, he'd say, go to this section of the Bible. It'll give you every single verse on parenting that you ever have to know. But he didn't do that either. What does he do? He gives us a story from Genesis to Revelation. It encompasses all those things. It encompasses marriages. It encompasses parenting. It encompasses being a student, being raised in a godly home, being raised in an ungodly home. It encompasses all those things, but it does so in the framework of a story. Paul Tripp says, the overarching story reflects the fact that our problem as human beings is deeper than the individual sins that we commit each day, creating the specific problems that complicate our lives. Our deepest problem is that we seek to find our identity outside the story of redemption, which means our greatest solution to our deepest problem means finding our identity inside the story of redemption, not outside of it. Number one in John chapter five this morning, authority, God's authority. What does it sound like? Look at verse 31. John five, if I alone bear witness about myself, 
my testimony is not true. There's another who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne to witness the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and a shining lamp, but you were unwilling, but you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Jesus says, if he alone bears witness that he is God, his testimony, nobody can take him seriously if he alone said that. But there are others that testify about him. There's witnesses. And one of them is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was completely unlike Jesus. Jesus was hated. Um, He was ridiculed. He was despised. He was rejected. John the Baptist was loved. He was popular. Even Herod didn't want to ultimately kill John the Baptist. And most importantly, John the Baptist, he was prophesied in Isaiah. He was the herald. He was the messenger that would prepare the way for the king. And the Jews loved the message because they desperately loved the king. They wanted the king. Jesus brings up John because if they would listen to John's message, it would eventually lead them to the king. It would lead them to Jesus. And here's what I want you to see. Three times, verse 31, verse 32, and verse 33, Jesus says a reference to the truth. God's word, his authority is truth. Remember Pilate's question? Before Jesus goes to his crucifixion, what is truth, ultimately? The truth is found in Jesus. And Christianity is a religion that says Christianity and Jesus is truth. Christianity is true. And what the secular world wants you to believe is that any religious claim to truth will lead to two things. It will lead to violence and it will lead to bickering. Civic cultural leaders around the world today are using three approaches to world peace. The first approach is outlaw religion. Soviet Russia, communist China, Nazi Germany, we're going to outlaw it. We're going to take it into our own hands. Number two, they try to condemn religion. Um, all of these systems are, are to be judged. They're wrong. They're false because they all make a claim to truth. Who can ultimately know the truth? Number three, and this is probably the most dangerous way that the truth of religion is being um, fought against now in our world, is that people are trying to radically privatize the faith, any faith. It's, it's yours, it's your faith, what's good for you is fine for you, what's good for me is fine for me. Postmoderns, they really focus on number two, they love to condemn religion. And they say things like this, all religions are equally valid and teach basically the same thing. There's a a lot of different paths that you can ultimately take to get to the top of the mountain, whether that's the Muslim path, the Christian Judeo path, or the Hindu path, or whatever other path. They're all going to the same place. Leslie Newbegin has given this illustration. It's pretty popular. He says, imagine that there's six blind men who come up to an elephant, and they don't know that it's an elephant. And all six of these men come up to an elephant, and they touch part of the elephant, and they try to describe what they touch. The first blind man, he goes up and he touches the trunk of the elephant. He says, oh man, this uh, this animal is long and slender. It seems to be something like a snake. Another guy, another blind man goes up and he touches the the leg of the elephant. He says, no, not at all. This, This animal is huge and flat. And another one touches the side of the elephant. And he says something else different about what the elephant is. And they, and they all come to this, this conclusion that all religions have some grasp of the truth. All these blind men had some grasp of the truth that it was an elephant, but they don't have the grasp of the truth that it's an elephant. And the illustration backfires. This is what, this is what you're going to hear in the universities. Every, every path leads up the mountain, different path, it's okay. The illustration backfires because the story is told from the perspective of somebody who's not blind, Somebody, the story is told from the perspective of somebody who knows that this is ultimately an elephant. How can you know that each blind man sees only part of the elephant unless you claim to see the whole thing? How can you possibly know that no religion can see the whole truth unless you yourself have the superior comprehensive knowledge of the spiritual truth that that's an elephant? And basically what the postmodern agenda tries to claim is that the fact that there's multiple ways to God, that's the ultimate truth. And so they deny that there can be an ultimate claim to truth, and in the fact of denying there can be an ultimate claim to truth, that's the truth that they proclaim. 
That's the truth that they believe, and it totally cycles in on itself. It implodes on itself. If there really is one ultimate truth, one true religion, and all the others false, it would say, this is the truth. This is the absolute, and this is the final truth. There is, all other religions are false. There is no other truth. What does God's authority sound like? It sounds like absolute truth. In the testimony of Jesus, he says, this is truth. It's not just my testimony. It's John's testimony. It's others' testimony that Christianity is the truth. You cannot simply dismiss Christianity on the basis of its exclusivity. Just because it's exclusive in nature, you cannot deny it ultimately. Number two, what authority looks like. Look at verse 36. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. The voice you have never heard his form, the voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one in whom he sent. D.A. Carson says this about these verses, however valuable the testimony of John the Baptist to Jesus before a watching world, Jesus employs a testimony to his person and mission that is far weightier, and the weightier testimony is the witness of the Father. When John the Baptist gets thrown into prison and he knows his life is coming to an end, he has a lot of questions concerning this one who claims to be the Messiah, the king that he announced. If this truly is the Messiah, he's supposed to come and he's supposed to conquer the Romans and overtake the pagan governments. Here I am in a Roman prison because of my belief and my faith in in Jesus, in this Messiah. So he sends his followers to Jesus and he says to him, Are you the one whom we've expected, or should we expect somebody else? And remember what Jesus says to the followers of John. He says this, Go tell John what you see and what you hear. The blind are healed, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf have their ears unstopped, the dead are raised. And John knew that when the king would come from Isaiah 35, there would be distinct signs There would be miraculous signs that accompany his ministry. And today we see the same signs of the Father. We we see the miraculous, but we try to rationalize them away. And I don't know if any of you guys have picked up this book, A Reason for God, The Reason for God, Tim Keller. Uh, It used to be required reading. Is it uh, it still required reading, senior year at at Berean? Um, It's required reading reason for God. And he makes a a great, great claim to some of these truths. It's very well worth it. If you have teenagers in the house, you need to read this book. The works of the Father, you know, we might not see the blind healed and the deaf, the ears unstopped and the lepers cleansed. Maybe we will see that. Uh, But we do see the works of the Father through creation, the miracles of the Father through creation all around us. And the secular world says, yeah, the miracles have happened, but it's, it, just, it was a big bang. It all of a sudden, it just happened, and all these things came to be. And the best secular scientists today, uh, Richard Dawkins, all the, all the great atheist thinkers today will say that the universe that we live in had an origin. It had a beginning. It hasn't always been here. And that's good because the Christian faith also believes that the universe that we live in has an origin. It has a beginning. And God was the creator of it. Christ and the Son of God was the creator of it. Christians also believe that the universe has an origin. But the secular word tries to explain this through simple coincidence. And Richard Dawkins will say that how do you know, yeah, our world has been perfectly inhabitable. It's amazing that this has all come about. But how do you know there's not thousands of other universes out there that are perfectly inhabitable? How do you know that the Big Bangs aren't happening everywhere through the infinity that is space and through creation? And uh, the response to that is what's called the fine-tuning argument of creation. And he says that the chances that a habitable, habitable world just happened to come about in time, you would have the same chance of sitting down at a poker table and being dealt 20 straight hands of all aces, four aces, every time you sit down at a poker table. On top of that, John Leslie gives the illustration 
he says there could be 50 trained marksmen who go to a firing squad, and they're about to fire on a guy from six feet away. Now, there's a chance that all those 50 trained marksmen are going to miss their mark from six feet away. There's a chance that that would happen. And it's the same chance that just so happens that this universe, being all the ingredients that it has made, nitrogen, oxygen, being the habitable, habitable planet that we live in, the chance that that would just happen is the same chance that all 50 of these trained marksmen would miss their mark at the exact same time, the same chance that you'd be be dealt 20 hands of four aces every single time in a row. You'd be crazy to think that that's a coincidence. Now, that doesn't necessarily prove that Christianity is true. It doesn't just, it's not the fail ultimate proof that this is the truth and this is a historical reality. But what Keller says in his book, The Reason for God, he says, It takes a lot more faith to believe that that's not true than it takes to believe that that actually is true. And it's the reason for God. He's saying, don't just check your brain at the door. For something like this to happen, you have to at least consider, just consider that it might be true. Consider that the works of the Father in creation might have come about at His origin. What's interesting is, is where the Apostle Paul lands on the works of the Father and on creation. Because the Apostle Paul says, there's not only a chance that you might come to faith in God and believe that God created the universe. He says, in Romans chapter 1, all of us know God in the heart of our hearts. He says, really, the fallen world believes, actually rejects God, even though we do know him, which takes it even a step further. We all know God, but we reject God. The question is, what does God's authority look like? Jesus says, look what I've accomplished. Look at creation. Look at the miracles, the healing, the divine power over nature. Look at Lazarus. These are all works of the Father, and all of them testify about me. John, the Gospel of John, has seven signs that testify about the Father, about Jesus. He turned water into wine. He heals the official son, heals the paralytic, feeds 5,000 walks on water, heals a blind man, and finally he raises Lazarus. The the eighth one is raising himself from the grave. Authority sounds like absolute truth. It is absolute truth. Authority looks like the miraculous, looks like works of the Father. Finally, what authority tastes like, what it lives like, and this will probably be the hardest uh, for us this morning. Jesus is about to get very pointed with the religious here. Look at verse 39. He says to the religious of his day, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you might have life. And let me just give you the first glaring observation here. The Jews, the religious elite, searched the scriptures, and the Greek means that they scanned it. Uh, The NET version says they meticulously examined it. They questioned the text, they copied the text, they analyzed the text, and yet they missed the text. They missed ultimately where it led. They read about their king, but when they saw their king in the flesh, they missed him. And N.T. Wright says, when Jesus spoke of the scripture needing to be fulfilled, he was not simply envisaging himself doing a few scattered and random acts which corresponded to various distant and detached prophetic sayings. He was thinking of the entire storyline at last coming to fruition, of an entire world that hints and shadows are now coming to plain statement and to full light. Jesus is the climax of everything that Moses said in the law. You've looked at the details. These reveal who I am. These works lead to me. You read Moses. You don't understand Moses. Moses condemns you, is what Jesus will say. If you think you have submitted yourself to the authority of the Scripture, but you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, you are ruling your own life, and you have not submitted yourself to the authority of Scripture. A person who submits himself to the authority of the Scripture is a person who has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. This is the authority. This is where it leads to. This is where it climaxes. This is where it is fulfilled in the person and the work of Jesus. The king you have, he says to the Jews, is the king of your own making. And it gets worse. Look at verse 41. 
I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you would have believed in Moses, you would believe in me, for he wrote of me. But you do not believe his writings. So how will you believe my words? Uh, A couple of Sundays ago, our small group met at our house for tacos and fellowship, just to hang out. And it was a great time of fellowship. It was a great time of tacos, but it was a great time also of Sunday football. There's a game on TV. Uh, Green Bay Packers were playing the Atlanta Falcons. And so we, we turned on the TV and we were eating tacos and hanging out and watching the Green Bay game. And it was a great game. It was going down to the wire, almost, almost to the last minute. Um, Aaron Rodgers orchestrated this comeback. He takes the lead with like three minutes left in the game and puts the Packers up by more than a field goal. It was, it was awesome. And I'm, I'm sitting there leading the small group. Guys, you know, we could look into the Word of God, but let's watch the Packers because this is what we need to do this week. And so we were watching it, and we're all sitting on the edge of our seats, and then, um, I don't know, who's it, Matt Ryan, the quarterback of the Atlanta Falcons, he comes back with like two minutes left in the game, goes down, scores a touchdown. They go up by, by three points or four points, and um, there's like 20 seconds left in the game. And here's what I did. I mean, I, I love football, and whether the Packers win or lose, I'm still going to be a Packer fan. That's what, it, that's what a true fan is, you know. So K-State guys out there, you can still watch the game, you know, we can still cheer on our guys. When the Atlanta Falcons scored with like 20 seconds left in the game, I, I got up, I put my tacos and my cookie down, and I walked over to the TV, and I turned it off. <laughs> and I walked back to my seat. I don't even want to watch the end of it, because I know what's going to happen. Jesus was the perfect fulfillment of Moses, all right? Everything that Moses said led to Jesus. He comes on the scene and he says to Bible students, to the seminary graduates of his day, you don't believe in Moses. Moses condemns you. And here's what the Jewish leaders did. They heard Jesus' words and they walked right up to him and they turned him off. And they said, I've heard enough. I don't want to listen anymore to anything that you guys have to say or to anything Jesus has to say. Well, why did, they do, why did they do that? Why do I do that when I know my Packers are going down? They didn't like what he said. And the truth of the matter is, neither do I. Sometimes I really don't like what Jesus says in the authority of his word. You cannot have Jesus at the center of your life ruling over your heart If every time he says something that offends you, you turn it off, you're not interested. There are a thousand things that God says under his authority and his word that I do not want to hear. Briley's sleeping right now. She doesn't want to hear some of this stuff. There's a thousand things that I don't want to hear. Forgive others as I have forgiven you with no strings attached. No strings attached but you don't understand what that guy did to me. I don't want to forgive him with no strings attached. That's what the authority of God says to do. Let no bitterness take root in your heart and in your life because it's only going to give way to sin. But I I really want to be bitter against this person. If you've got something against somebody that you need to deal with, you go to them. You talk to them one-on-one. If they don't listen to you, you take another person with you. I don't I don't like conflict. You don't understand. I'll just, I'll just let this pass. I'll talk about it with my wife at nighttime. I'll, you know, I'll get it all out, and then we can just, over time, it's going to go away. God's Word says you cannot do that. If you want to live with the Lord reigning over your heart and with the authority of God's Word, you cannot do that. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. I don't want to humble myself under the mighty hand of God. I want to rule my life. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Anything you have in your life that you want more than God, Jesus says it's an idol. 
you're worshiping idols. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear about all the idols that I have in my life. We just, we just went through an election. Romans chapter 14, chapter 13, what does it say? Submit to the government authorities that God has placed over you. I really don't want to submit to the government authorities that God has placed over me, but that's what the authority of God's word says to do. And it says to submit other times as well. It says to submit to your elders. You don't understand who our elders are. You don't understand these guys. How am I supposed to submit to them? Man, (laughs) this is not easy. The authority of God's word is not easy, but that's exactly what he calls us to do. And that's exactly how it works. When Martin Luther, Leland was talking about Luther, nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel in, in 1517 on October, October 31st. The one reason that he did that, the one ultimate reason that he was able to go to the church and to, to say exactly what was wrong was because they put the final authority in the lips of men rather than in the lips of God from the pages of Scripture. The authority of God's word was the ultimate basis for everything he did. He studied the Greek. He studied the Hebrew. He saw justification by faith. And he said, the church leaders are teaching nothing about this in the gospel. He saw the purchasing of indulgences. Johann Tetzel, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. The worst part about Johann Tetzel and his his ministry, what he did, if you can even call it a ministry, is that he appealed to the least educated and to the poorest of society. And he said, you can purchase your way out of purgatory and out of hell and gain your salvation through your giving. And to them, to the poor, and to the needy of the society at that time, Tetzel was a celebrity. They loved him. In Wittenberg, Frederick, the elector of Saxony, wouldn't let Johann Tetzel come into Wittenberg to sell indulgences. He said, you can't come into the city and do this. This is not right for you to do it. So he set up shop at the gates of the city. And every traveler that went in and out of the city, he would be right there selling indulgences on the way in and on the way out. And Tetzel's rule was so minor in the Reformation, but Luther said this exemplifies everything about the church at this time. And weeks after Luther posted his 95 theses on the, on the door of the Wittenberg Chapel, just a few weeks after that, Tetzel posted 106 anti-theses to, to contradict what Luther was saying. And here's the thing, every great awakening that the church has ever experienced, every great revival in the history of the church, certainly the German Reformation, these are not gifted, glorious, glamorous preachers coming with charisma to sway the masses. They're tall, tan, and terrific, and they speak great things, and they can gather uh, a longing, and and a group of people will follow them. Every great revival and every great Reformation And every appeal that has inspired the church to do something miraculous, all of it has started with a simple appeal back to the authority of God's word. Jonathan Edwards was the most dry, boring preacher that you would ever listen to in your entire life. He was preaching the gospel and he was preaching the word because nobody had heard it. And a great revival went through. There's two Greek words that can be translated as authority. One of them is dunamis. It means the ability, the strength to do something because nothing stands in your way. It's the power of God. It's the authority of God. The other Greek word is exousia, and it means having the right or permission. The exousia, the authority of God, can be conferred from a higher place. And so when we speak of the authority of God's word over our lives, we declare that it has a power and authority of our lives that nothing has, nothing stands in the way of the authority of God's word. That it has the inherent right and the permission to rule over our lives. And here's what I want to end, just with, just with three kind of quick points here. None of us at our core want the authority of God. All of us desperately need the authority of God. None of us want it. All of us desperately need it, and the gospel always contains it. None of us want the authority of God. All of us desperately need the authority of God, and the gospel always contains it. None of us at the core of our being want the authority of God. Our culture has championed 
if our culture has championed anything in the last 75 years, it has championed the individual. We are a culture that lives without boundaries. We don't conform to anyone or to anything. And there's an unprecedented primacy for the individual in our day. We want what we want, how we want to do it, and when we want it. Neiman Marcus has championed the slogan, no rules here. Nike has had this this slogan for a long time, just do it. Regardless if it's wrong, regardless if it's right, just do it. Burger King, you can have it your way anytime you go. We not only despise authority, we reject authority. And the problem is much, much grander than just what the judges proclaimed. In that day, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The problem really goes back to Genesis 3 and back to the garden. And the voice of authority said this, From any tree in the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree that's in the midst of the garden, in the middle of the garden, you shall not eat it. And here's the dilemma for Adam and for Eve. Will I do what God wants me to do, or will I do what I want to do regardless? And instead of submitting to the sovereign authority of God, Adam and Eve submitted to the sovereign authority of the individual, of themselves. They did what they wanted to do, when they wanted to do that. And from that moment on, listen carefully, from that moment on, from Genesis 3, all sin becomes an issue of submission to the will of God. At the core of our being, we all sin because all of us don't want to submit And because all of us want to be in control. We want to be in control of our lives. We want to make the calls. None of us instinctively, at the core of our being, want the authority of God. Because none of us wants to submit. But all of us desperately need it. Ever since the garden, Satan has convinced us that we are capable of ruling our own lives. And so in our capability for ruling our own lives... We look for safety, we look for peace, and we look for happiness. And we think we can find them through our military, our bank accounts, our careers, our marriages, our families, things in life. And when one of those things is lost, when any of those things are lost, and we lose the will to live, those things become idols. And we realize we are not worshiping God, we are worshiping our own desires and our own wants. Nietzsche said, there are more idols in the world than there are realities. And apart from submission to God's authority, we submit to everything else. Why do we desperately need to submit to the authority of of God? Because if we don't, we will spend the rest of our lives submitting to everything else, convinced that we can find happiness and, and total pleasure in those things. God's authority says you will never find happiness and total pleasure in those things. You need to submit to the authority of God. We desperately need the authority of God. And finally, the gospel always contains it. In the person and work of Jesus, he did on the cross what none of us could fully do in our own humanity and our own flesh. Jesus always submitted to the will and to the authority of God. In the very act of insubordination in the garden was reversed by an act of submission, willing submission in another garden years and years later. As we battle for sin, against sin, for the rest of our lives, it's a gospel battle. The truth of the gospel is that we finally submit our lives to the will of God, that there is a God in the world, that he has sent his son Jesus Christ to redeem us, and that we can willingly submit to his will. But there's a gospel implication for the rest of our lives that has to do with submission and to the authority of God. Every time You have sin in your life and you say, I want control. I want to do what I want to do. You are wrestling with an issue of submission to the authority of God. And when you wrestle with an issue of the submission to the authority of God, you are wrestling with an issue of the gospel. And the gospel says this, submit to God's authority. For that is the only place that you will find happiness, complete pleasure, and the right thing to do. In all, in all of your life, that's the only place you'll find God in that. All of us read these verses, and we eventually come to some 
that we do not like, (laughs) the tendency for us is to walk up and to turn it off. The authority of God's Word is not just the black and white texts of Scripture. The authority of God's Word says that Jesus came to fulfill all the plan of redemption of the kingdom of God. And he has rescued us from the domain of darkness and ushered us into the domain of light and the kingdom of light through his son. And he has broken the bondage that was against us. He has broken the chains of sinfulness and and spiritual realities who are against us. All of that is in the kingdom. It's in the glory of God. It's in the plan of God's authority. And so we submit to the authority of God means that we submit to the story of God and his will over our lives. So let's pray. Uh, Thank you for being here on Sunday and and hope you guys have a a great rest of the weekend. Father in heaven, you know, it's so easy for us to uh, be involved in our devotional readings of the text and see these things on the pages of scripture that threaten our happy way of life and our individual existence. And we want to just turn it off. We want to shut the words of scripture but we have to look deeper than just the black and white text. We have to look to the story, to the, to the fulfillment of Jesus and what he came to do, to rescue Israel, to rescue us from the domain of darkness. And all of this is captured in the authority of God. Father, give us a will and a desire to submit ourselves to God no matter what, to read these verses of Scripture, to see the story of Scripture and know that you are for us, you are not against us, and that there's a great hope awaiting us at the end of all times. Lord, we pray for your return when our faith will be sight, that you will gather all of us together in a great kingdom feast, and we will be with you in your presence forever. God, we pray that you would haste the day. We ask all this to you, Father, through the Son and by the Spirit, for you three are the one true God, and there is no God besides you. Amen.